Dr. Gardner Street 100 isn't in the best of conditions. Um, so maybe that traffic is affecting some people's survival, which is entirely fine. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, our wonderful uh, panel of experienced hikers here, as well as all of you. Um, this is the ninth annual Green Mountain Club End to Enders panel. Um, last year we had about 60 people in the audience, and then Orca Media provided us for live stream with over 400 people watching it um, through YouTube. If you consider that going on for nine years, then we've reached quite a bit of people with this uh, with this opportunity, and that's really special. Um, so thank you for participating in this, and I hope that you find it useful and productive. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Green Mountain Club maintains a long trail in Vermont. Um, long trail is the nation's oldest long distance hiking trail. Started in 1910 by James T. Taylor as he sat in the area of Stratton Mountain waiting for the mist to clear. Um, his whole idea came from wanting to provide this experience across the entire length of Vermont, um, giving people the ability to see all of the state, to connect with the mountains, and, and really to have the mountains play an impact on their everyday lives. Um, and so that's what we are continuing to do. That is the Green Mountain Club's foremost foremost priority is protecting and maintaining the long trail. Um, so while this might be our headquarters, it goes the entire length of Vermont. So you will find a Green Mountain Club volunteer or um, somebody hiking the long trail, obviously, the entire length of Vermont. Um, and I think that's really cool that we spread the whole state. Um, <coughs> My name is Lauren. I'm the Outreach and Field Coordinator here with the Green Mountain Club. I've been at the club for about 18 months, and my main priorities are working with uh, volunteer groups, such as Boy Scouts, summer camps, college orientation trips, to help them schedule uh, volunteer opportunities on the long trail. I also do all of our Leap No Trace education and work with our caretakers and our long trail patrol to go out and steward the trail the way that they do. Um, and I wanted to run a couple things by you for the evening. Um, in case anybody needs, there's uh, the bathrooms are right behind you in this main room here. There's also one bathroom down the stairs. There's some water on the back table there. And then um, the two main exits are right down at the bottom of the stairs to the left and to the right. And those will bring you right outside. Um, and, you know, this is going to be a pretty free form event. So if you have a question, raise your hand. If there's anything that's a uh, a burning thought in your head, then don't be afraid to speak up. Um, and this is, you know, a learning opportunity for everybody, so we'll try and uh, make the best out of that we possibly can. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to go along the panel here, and everybody, if you want to take a couple minutes and uh, maybe introduce yourselves with, with what's in front of you there, and and start start us off from the right foot here. So Daniel, can you go first? Sure. Hey, uh, I'm Dan Braun. Uh, I'm from Morristown, Vermont. Uh, my trail name is Country Time because uh, actually I bought a really, really big amount of lemonade mix by accident. Uh, also, it has a little bit of an ironic slant because I was born in Queens, New York. Uh, I through hiked uh, with my niece slash goddaughter slash very excellent hiking partner, Tori. Shout out, Tori. Uh, my favorite section on the long trail is the Mount Mansfield area because it's where I'm from. And what I offer as a panelist is Whatever I can answer for you. Awesome. Uh, my name is Hilary Orsini. My trail name was Hoot because my spirit animal is an owl and I am fun. <laughs> 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 I grew up in Sutton, Vermont, which is in the Northeast Kingdom in the middle of nowhere. And I, I section hiked the trail. I did the first half with my dad, who was here. And then was shredding my Achilles tendon, so left the trail and, and came back and did it um, like six years later in, in bits. I worked my way up north with my friend Paul. Um, my favorite location on the trail, it's kind of hard. I think it is like completely dependent on what my mood and blood sugar was like at any time, but I remember with my dad, White Rocks was really amazing, um, just magical. And then uh, Laraway was when we got there, it was um, raining and misty, and there were birds, and it was just like this, almost a spiritual experience, so I love that. Um, as a panelist, I think um, I can offer, uh, okay. <laughs> um, honesty, I think it was really hard. It was like one of the hardest things, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done, and I'm really proud of it. Um, 
and I think that the hard parts are really funny. I'm also a comic, so I'm going to tell you what actually happened. <laughs> uh, my name's Andrew Maxfield. Uh, I go by Stretch. Uh, pretty much I'm just a normal person, stretched out a little bit bigger, and it uh, helps me get across the mud spots, so my shoes stay a little cleaner than the average person hiking next to me, which is nice. Um, hometown, I'm uh, originally from the Burlington area. I live up in northern Vermont now, Highgate. So I actually, uh, as I was hiking, I was pretty much telling everyone as I started down south, I was hiking home, because it's pretty much the end of the trail is about 40 minutes from my house, so it's a long way to get there. Um, I through hiked uh, actually two different segments. So I started in the, in the beginning of the summer, and due to my, my little pup dog, who uh, didn't make it the whole time, she uh, got tired and through all the rain, uh, stopped, and then I picked it back up a few months later and finished up. So I did like three days and then like another a uh, couple weeks after that. Uh, so I did it by myself. I uh, started with my dog. I always had that ambition that she was going to do it with me. I just waited until she got a little too late in her life to make it. So there's a good point on that. If you want to try to bring your dog, make sure they're in good shape and not 10 to 15 pounds overweight. Um, now she's even more. So hopefully she's not listening. I'm not saying anything bad about her. Um, favorite location? Uh, White Rocks was absolutely amazing. The White Pine Forest was absolutely phenomenal. It's something so unique compared to the, uh, you know, the maple forest and hardwood forest up north where I'm from. Uh, that was amazing. Then also the, the ridge going from like Mount Abraham over to uh, the single chair lift up on top of Mad River. You're just hiking on, a, on a, almost a peak along the whole way. You look off either side and it's down for, you know, what was that, six, seven miles at least. It was, I don't know, something about that day when I hit it, it was amazing. Getting on top of Mount Abraham, hitting Mount uh, Ellen, the first 4,000 footer, really starting to hit those mountains. Um, I don't know, it was just, it was a good day. I think it had a lot to do with that too. How your mood was, how the weather was, um, what you had for breakfast, or what you didn't have, um, made it a lot. Uh, what I can offer is just, um, you know, experience with someone that's lived in Vermont and wanted to do it my whole life, and uh, finally had to get off my butt and do it. Um, and it took some ambition and timing. Uh, you know, I work full time, I think like most people, a lot of people do, and it takes time to do. And now, you know, I have ambitions to do it with my whole family here, uh, wife and three kids in the next couple of years. I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about it. <laughs> um, I'm Alexis Peters. Uh, my trail name was Grizzly Squirrel, which is kind of a long story, but um, pretty much I had a dream my first night out that a squirrel was attacking me. Um, <laughs> I'm from Mystic, Connecticut originally, um, and I through hiked alone last summer. Um, my favorite location on the trail is probably the section between the Lincoln Gap and the App Gap because I grew up spending a lot of time in that area. Um, that's kind of where I was a kid, like, oh wow, there's a trail that goes the whole length of the state. I'm going to do this someday. And so when I finally made it there, it's like, I guess I'm doing it now, um, <laughs> but still had a long way to go. And um, what I can offer as a panelist, I guess just my enthusiasm to share what my experience is like because... I know ever since like last August, it's I talk about it pretty regularly, and it'll be nice to talk to people who actually want to hear about it. For a change. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Leanna. Um, my trail name is All Good. Um, it's pretty cool that I got a trail name. I was really nervous about getting a trail name. I don't know how many of you have a trail name and have hiked. Um, but there's sometimes a moment of, am I going to get one? Um, but I got mine from a legit um, AT through hiker, so that was kind of cool, and his name was Sunny. So I felt like getting a name like All Good from someone named Sunny was a pretty neat moment. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania, a really small town in the middle of the state, so part of coming to Vermont was I'd never been up here, got to experience this amazing place, and then get to come back for something like this. Um, I through hiked last summer in July to the beginning of August. I went by myself but met some of the most amazing people and have kept in touch with a lot of those folks. So even though I was by myself, I don't feel like that I was by myself the whole time. Um, favorite location? I remember a moment at Kid Gore Shelter when I set up my tent on the edge of the mountain and I would watch the sunset and watch the sun rise and I just felt like I was in the mountains, and I was like, I could stop right now and be okay. It was just so amazing, and that was so early on, so I had so many more amazing, amazing opportunities ahead and experiences ahead. Um, what do I have to offer as a panelist? 
Oh, goodness. <laughs> I have a lot to learn still. <laughs> That's something I'll be honest with you about, and that was very much in my communication with Lauren before this, is that I'll be honest in that um, I have my experiences to share, but I will be very honest in that I have a lot to learn as well. Can I interject really quickly? Your pictures of that camping spot at Cape Roar, Yeah. you'll see them, and it's like the most dreamy place with the bright sun and the green leaves. It's really there's like three times where you get a view, it's really cool. Um, hi, I'm Taryn. Um, my trail name is Yellow Crocs. I was given that by my sister because I brought a pair of bright yellow Crocs, which I wore when I wasn't wearing my hiking boots. Um, I'm from Shelburne, Vermont, and I section hiked the long trail. Um, it took from about May to September. Um, I hiked with my family, my sister, my mom, and my dad, and my two little dogs. Um, my favorite location on the long trail was probably Devil's Gulch. Um, it was just really pretty. There was a lot of rocks, and it was green. Um, what I have to offer as a panelist is a different perspective on the long trail and hiking with a family. So my name is Jenny, and I come from the same place that Taryn does. Um, I never grew up and got a trail name, so... Um, <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> I'll just have to do it again. Um, I have a little bit different perspective than Taryn and, and the way that we did it. I kind of feel like we sectioned hiked the northern part, but then we hiked 200 miles continuously in the, in the, from the southern part to the middle of the state. Um, again, but as Taryn said, we hiked um, with, our, with our whole family, and it was because of Taryn. Um, she had set it as a goal the summer before when we were hiking out in the um, Grand Tetons and out in Yosemite. She said, next summer I want to hike the long trail. I want to hike the whole thing, um, and I want to through hike it. And so uh, we worked as a family to figure out how we can do it. And I think that's what, we, what I have to offer is how can we um, take a dream and ambition of, a, of our family, especially the younger members of our family, and make it happen. Awesome. Thank you all of you for that. Um, and I think one sense I got from, um, from, from Hillary and Andrew is the your blood sugar and your food intake makes a difference, um, which is pretty obvious, so we can talk about that at some point, um, which I think is fun. There is a really wonderful slideshow with a bunch of pictures that everybody sent in. Um, so I think we'll take some time and uh, kind of breeze through that and let ourselves focus and, um, you know, if you guys want to get up yeah, and move around, that sounds great. Um, that's something I overlook. Um, Actually, we're just going to do it a whole lot of time. But I'm going to just start this.
Cape Gore, right? Yeah, that's Cape yeah. Gore. <coughs> the sun sets on your left over the shelter, and it rises on the right, and it's just amazing. That's up on Lara Way, like you mentioned, the mist and stuff. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. See some yellow cracks there? Yeah, so. series of photos uh, right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
That's an interesting one, uh, if you want. Yeah, you know what, go ahead and pick that one. That's kind of neat. Uh, it just, and the reason that it's cool, um, I, I, I took a picture at every shelter that I went to. I figured, hey, if I'm coming out here and doing this, I'm gonna see all of them, you know? We're not walking past any. And so every single time uh, that, that I got to a shelter, I took a selfie, oh, uh, nice. or an usie, <laughs> depending on. And my niece is in almost all of them. Um, and it's really interesting. That the reason this picture is interesting to me is because really what it does that I didn't expect it was going to do is it provides a really brief little synopsis of my entire trip. And I can look at any one of these pictures and I can remember what happened on that day and the kind of day that it was and where we went from there and what were the next thing that happened. And most significantly, um, the, the one that is sitting there all alone is Boy's Shelter, which is right here in the middle and I got my orange hood on. My niece is not there and uh, that was because I actually lost her that day. Uh, no, on the left side, oh, right here. and um, it was it was pretty exciting stuff. Uh, we we ended up deviating it a little bit from from our procedures. We got split up, and we didn't end up meeting up again until past that shelter, which was Skyline Lodge. And um, it it was it was quite quite an exciting day to say the least. Um, but I, I dig this picture a lot because it's uh, you know if anybody asks, did you really do it? Well, that's the only picture I ever have to show anybody, and uh, it's a really nice reminder of kind of the whole thing wrapped up in a neat little package. Um, but you have to go to the, the very first slide, which yeah. like I sent one picture. Yep. <laughs> I <laughs> we took more pictures. There I am. That's me and my friend Paul. That face is pretty much how I felt most of the time on the trail. But I, you know, yeah. and I did take some more pictures. But um, it's just I guess it's making me think about how uh, that wasn't the the purpose for me or that wasn't the point. Like I, I was actually, it was a kind of a relief to not be looking at things through the lens of like how nice of an image is this to share or or how will I remember this. I, I really focused on the journal um, and, and just was present for the whole thing. Um, but I love the other pictures that people took. We absolutely, I need this now because I don't have any of this. <laughs> The old show, show the people. Yeah. So, did you write two whole journals? No, I uh, had the first one, and then it was too special, so I had to get a second one. Gotcha. Yeah, so you spent a lot more time. <coughs> Daniel, um, uh, Andrew, I'm going to find Daisy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so there's this ferret sanctuary that has somebody kind of petting a ferret. Uh, ferret milking and ferret stomping. So you see those signs. Every, if anybody does hiking, those are at the front of almost every trail. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I, yeah, that just cracked me up. Those, those type of things yeah. we keep saying out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the Green Mountain does not support any three of them. No, no. <laughs> Ferret stopping's out. No. Right oh, Ferret yeah. stopping definitely uh, out of the question. Discouraged. Alexis? Um, there's one up like towards the beginning of a jar of pickles. Uh, down over. Oh, right there. That one? Yeah. Um, so I don't eat a lot of salt normally so like six days in or so I was like really crashing because I didn't have enough salt so I panicked and hitchhiked into town to buy that jar of pickles <laughs> and that was like the best thing I'd had in a week <laughs> um, which is all that and the, the nuts and some powdery um, but yeah that was um, quite the adventure 
I'd never hitchhiked before, um, and I wasn't planning on doing it, but sometimes you're really desperate, and it was worth it for the pickles. <laughs> um, we we kind of talked about Kid Gore already. That definitely would would be for me. That's the photo I like to look at, and it just takes me back to that moment. I remember walking up to that shelter thinking, where am I going? And coming around the corner and just being like, this is where I'm staying tonight? Like, I got to live in Vermont in the woods for 30 days. And that was just amazing. It just truly was, I mean, I look at that and I just go to that moment. And I think that's so much like what this provides is an opportunity to kind of get that feeling back. And, you know, it's so important to keep that feeling with you, you know, throughout life when you're not on the trail as well. So that's it. Good. So the, one of my favorite pictures is the one where we're lying on the back, surrounded by mud, and the dog yeah. is looking at me and she's saying, what, <laughs> what did you get us into? <laughs> um, because it, it, for me, it really, it, it says you really don't know what it is that you're going to experience on the trail. It was really wet, it was really muddy, but we were actually having a lot of fun at that moment. Um, it also talks to me about being prepared. We weren't prepared the first couple times that we went out with the dogs when it was raining. And um, they get cold too. And that was the one, the one thing that we actually ended up adding to our hike. Um, was the, the dog's raincoats because I, I don't care if it had been our lab who used to hike with us or not. I'd forgotten that they, they get wet, they get cold just like we do. Um, and so, this, as you see, we're all still smiling and laughing, but we, we're just kind of like, what are we doing out here? Um, a picture that takes me back to the, a memory of a long trail is the picture on top of Camel's Hump with um, a few people that took the picture. And it, you just meet the most amazing people on the long trail. I mean, though we were in the lodge with them, and I remember just playing spoons with them <laughs> that night, and they were just amazing. Like, and then we all left at different times, but we all met back up on top of Camel's Hump, and we took a picture together, and they're just awesome. Yep, the whole group of people. So. Mm -hmm. The one with the whole group. I think it was one of their first ones. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's right there. Either way, yeah. you get the point. Right there. <coughs> nice. That's a clear day on camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's cool. Awesome. Yeah. I was wondering if you could, it's kind of a prior question, if you could just roll down the line and kind of describe what your experience is as a hiker. Sure. Uh, I hike Vermont, uh, mostly, but uh, I do a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of avid outdoors in general, uh, which helps, I think, keep me in shape. I did train a little bit uh, for a few months leading up to it, but to be honest with you, looking back on what I did, kind of makes me laugh a little bit now. Because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you can, you can prepare as much as you like, but, you know, you're, you're never fully ready for whatever it is you're going to find out there. Uh, you, you do you do have uh, you know the ability to have uh, to, to get used to it you know to, to work up to it and to build your strength and and, and, and kind of uh, find your rhythm and your flow and I think when you do that uh, and you kind of settle in and you kind of find a bit of a balance and things sort of just kick in for you and then you kind of ride that wave. Mileage. 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 Oh, sorry, mileage. Yes. Uh, well, the mileage is a funny question. The spreadsheet that I had to plan this entire trip. <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, lasted one day, that plan, uh, a little bit less. It actually took about 19 hours. Um, uh, that plan was about 15 at the end of the entire operation, which was a rainy, muddy operation. Uh, we did about 10. About what? 10 miles a day. What was your pack uh, My pack was from a base of about 27, 28 pounds, and then throw six to eight pounds of food on top of that. So uh, when, on your first day, is you know pretty hefty, and then every day it's a couple pounds lighter, and 
then by the end of the week when you're starving, your pack's really light, so it works out. Um, I'm an avid hiker. I grew up hiking. Um, I averaged, I probably averaged about 12 miles a day, as few as six and as many as 19. I think it's really important to listen to your body and, and, and in terms of the training thing, you really, you really gear up as you go. So making sure that you're taking time on those first days to not only let your muscles and your lungs kind of recharge, but also your, your joints and your tendons. Um, and also the, the other thing that, that I kind of caught on as I continue to do this is that there's training and then there's how much am I going to put on my back. So I got the pack down from 35 pounds to like 22. And that's huge, especially for me, you know, it's like a real, it's like, 15% of my body weight or something. It's a huge yeah. yeah for somebody so, that's small, that's a huge difference. So thinking about it that way too. Can we come back to that in terms of the pack? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up hiking, so I'd say you know, I've hiked all over, I don't say the world, I'm, I'm in the military, so I get to travel. Um, I've, I've been to pretty much a lot of countries, a lot of states, and done a lot of hiking on you know, weekends and week-long trips, so that's let me do a lot of different areas. Um, <coughs> this was by far the biggest endeavor I ever did. It took uh, 18 days to divide the mileage by that. I had some really short days, uh, five, six miles at the end when we wanted to go down into Jay and hang out for the day, or um, up in the low 20s. And it all just, there again, like I said, listen to your body. A lot of it has to go back to food. You know, how well did you not just eat today? How well did you eat the day prior? And I definitely felt it. You know, some days you get up, you take too many of some supplement energy, they're like little jelly beans, which I found are horrible in my body. I say, give me a boost to get me going, but boy, the next day I was done. So I did away with that stuff. Um, it really, it really made a difference for me on what I ate. You know, taking meal with electrolytes helped a lot. Um, what was the other stuff? So, was mileage, um, pack weight. Uh, I would mid twenties when I was empty on food. When I re restocked and full of water, I was probably 31, 32 ish. So, um, so I've. Before the long trail, I'd done mostly like day hikes. I'd done one overnight that was three nights, and then another one that was one night, and that was it for like back backpacking. Um, so I was like experienced with hiking, but not with like that combined with camping out. Um, and for training, I guess I had been hiking a bit that summer, and I was running maybe like six miles a week or something, which helped, but it it's not the same as hiking. Um, I never knew how heavy my pack was. Um, I think it was probably between like 25 and 30. It was way too heavy at the beginning, so I met a whole bunch of AT through hikers down south and they basically went through my pack and were like, don't get rid of this, you don't need that, that piece of your stove, that's useless. And so I ended up sending a whole bunch of stuff home, um, which really helped. Um, and then, what was the other? Oh, mileage. Um, was probably about between 12, maybe 15 at the most was comfortable, but usually closer to 12. Um, some days I had like a five mile day if I went into town or just wanted to hang out in my hammock longer. So just kind of took it easy and I felt like it because you need to recharge mentally too. Um, it's so cool to hear everyone's stories. Are you looking to through, through hike? Yeah, we're for a full-time shoot, so we're hoping to do it for 22 days. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, I, am, I am not a numbers girl. <laughs> I have no idea what my pack weight was or what it is now or what it was during the whole duration. Um, I was on the trail 33 days, but not like on the trail the whole time. I know I had one day um, with a trail angel off of the trail. Um, so as far as my average, I'm not really sure what that was or how much I was doing per day. <laughs> I was just listening to myself and kind of going. I wasn't stressed for time, so it was really, I was focusing on the experience and I wanted to come home healthy. Um, as far as training, I very much like have been hiking for a long time. That's part of what I do regularly at home. Um, but backpacking was something that I had been wanting to do for a really long time, like oh, multiple overnights. Um, I completed the Camino Frances, which was 500 miles. Um, so that's not quite the same as backpacking at all, but it was still continual 500 miles. 
Um, and then the year after that, I com completed the Camino Portugues, which again, was shorter. It's not quite the same as backpacking, but still like that continual on your body day after day after day of miles and, and weight on your back. Um, this past summer before I came up to Vermont, I through hiked, it's called the Laurel Highlands Hiking Trail, and it's a 70 mile hike in Pennsylvania. And so that was kind of like my shakedown hike. And at that point, I didn't even know I was coming and doing the long trail. I went and did that, and that was kind of my inspiration for what is this summer going to be. So I did that, and when I came home, I ordered the map for the long trail, and then I went to the beach with friends, and I came back, and then I came to the long trail. Um, but from the past couple summers before this, um, I definitely learned as far as training, it's more than just your cardio, than the weight on your back. It's all those little muscles that are in your feet and legs. I continually, every single day throughout the winter, I have like a list of kind of exercises that I do just to work on all of those muscles. Because it's like those muscles that you forget, you know, your quads, your calves, those things, like we're used to, to running and working all of those, but all those little muscles, that's really important. Getting your arms ready for using your trekking poles day after day after day. So that would be my recommendation, is don't forget about all of those little muscles that help make all those big muscles work. Um, so our average mileage in the north was about 10 miles, and down south we did about 15 miles a day. Um, as far as training goes, we didn't do much training. I mean, I've been hiking since I was five, or backpacking since I was five. So we just kind of went out on the long trail, um, and my pack weighed about 20 pounds. So cool. Yeah. So I'm going to add a little bit to that. The, one of the things that we did to build up um, to do it with a family that was kind of we did wasn't purposeful, but ended up being very purposeful in the end, is that we started at the beginning of the summer when we were doing section hikes by doing section hikes that were between five and seven miles, and then we built up to doing um, doing consistent days of 10 miles a day um, for our day hikes um, and then overnights at the she was saying in the north of 10 miles a day and the north is definitely a lot more complicated and a lot more technical than the south was and so we anticipated that's what we would hike in the south when we flipped to the south because we and did our 200 miles we were doing we thought we, would, we went a lot faster than we thought because we were doing 15 miles a day with our longest day because of her wanting pizza at 17.5 Way to go. Our pack weight, um, we also, when we looked at our pack weights, we looked at the size of the person in our family. So Taryn uh, is the smallest of us. She carried the smallest pack at about 20 pounds. Uh, my daughter and I, I realized after the first day out that she and I are actually the same size and we should be carrying the same weight. So we equalized that at about 22, 25 pounds. And then Kevin, who's here with us, carried 30 or a little more. So. I do want to say something about working. One of the things that I learned with us for working, we'd taken five, uh, five weeks off the year before. And something that I ended up doing was, there's early on, the hikers told me, you need to take some zero days. So I actually took zero days in the office, um, rather than taking zero days on the weekends. And that made it feasible for us to do our through hike, because um, we would do two days in the office, seven, five to seven days out of the office. And that, that really helped. With the, um, with the weather here, can you speak up? What's happening? Yep. <coughs> yeah. Also, if anybody left their windows open, it might be too late. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to be clear about kind of our hiking. We've been backpacking with our kids since we were five, since they were five, um, and that really helped. But most of what we had done up to that point was one or two days, not five or seven days, um, seven days out. Um, and we had hiked 120 miles like the summer before out in the western um, parks. Um, are you just glad we're not on the long trail right now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, great. So I got a couple, you know, general questions that I think could kind of go off of that a little bit. Um, one that I think is really cool to think about um, for everybody that's out on the trail, you know, everyone here is a different person we've all had different trail experience and a phrase that I've heard a lot is is anybody hikes their own hike um, and I was wondering you know if maybe some of you have an opinion on that or if you've heard that phrase and how you interpreted that for your own experience on watching um, well, maybe uh, 
and I get like three volunteers raise your hands there. Andrew, yeah. start off. Um, no, I certainly think I, I've definitely heard that hike your own hikes. So, you know, some take pictures, some write in journals. I see some people hiking and have their earbuds in, and they're just cruising, listening <coughs> to music or, or, or a book or whatever it is they want to listen to. My son's actually out camping right now with the Boy Scouts, so I'm sure he's having a blast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, I definitely agree with that hike your own hike. I've thought about that in the past. I'm, I'm very much, I am a kind of a, a stats and organized, I plan a plan and I try to stick to it or exceed it. I'm very like goal oriented. Like I said, if I say I'm, I had a spreadsheet before I went out, I really did. And it was pretty darn detailed. I have the final version. There's five different versions of when it changed. Um, yeah, every day. It, I, yeah, it did. <laughs> and I, I always make a goal and that's what I wanted to do. Um, and that's the way, that's what motivated me. I was doing it on my own. I could hike it the way I wanted to hike it. And eventually I ran into a, a group of four other people that I ended up hiking with that were from everywhere. And I kind of adopted those a little bit. We were a little more easy going, just whatever. Uh, hike to wherever you hike and stop. If, if I look back on it, um, I, I've thought about this a lot over the last you know, year since I've done it or so, and be like, you know, I'd rather kind of do some other things. Like just, if I want to sleep in my hammock till noon and just relax and do that, do that, you know, put my phone away a little more. Not that I was on it, but you know, taking pictures. I say that now, I'm like, that's what I'd love to go out and do. I'd probably get out there and do the same darn thing I did the last time because that's just who I am. Um, but I do, I appreciate the way every single person hikes it. You meet down south the first 100 miles, so many AT hikers that are doing it their way. You know, they've already been on the trail for almost, uh, what, 1,700 miles at that point. You know, they're, they're kind of setting their ways. Um, and I appreciate the way every single one have done that. And uh, I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot from everyone I meet on the trail or didn't meet on the trail. Actually, a, a ton more right here. So it is. Um, everyone does it their way. And whatever makes you happy it is the way it needs to be. Um, another question I kind of had was, the, as I said, the Green Mountain Club maintains a long trail and, um, and the two are, are inextricably, inextricably connected. So, um, you, somebody maybe explain a time that you interact with a caretaker or a trail crew or maybe a sun steward. Um, <coughs> you want to go down there? So, a lot of the, um, some of our best experiences actually were with the Green Mountain Club because when, when you walk with two kids and two dogs, people don't really take you that seriously. Um, so the only trail magic we actually got was on the top of, um, on the top of Mansfield. And the, the, that, the person at that, that, that summit and the other um, Green Mountain Club folks were really excited for us and really excited for us being out there. Um, and I think that really made, made, our, made our journey. Um, and they, I also felt like they really respectfully got at those summits, guided people to where they should be and, and help with the vegetation and stuff in a way that was respectful and responsible when there were a lot of people up there. Anybody else on that? I found that, yeah, we, uh, we actually were, were fortunate enough to run into the entire crew uh, of caretakers up on Camel's Hump. I think Isaac was the fellow that was up there uh, and his, and uh, what a cool uh, bunch of people they were to meet. Uh, they were so, so welcoming. Uh, they were really glad to see us. They were supportive. They gave us food. Uh, they gave us drink. Uh, they wouldn't let us eat in the shelter, um, other things like that, which was important because you can't have bears in the shelter and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they were just dynamite. You can tell that the, the people that are out there doing this stuff are, are absolutely for real. You know, they're, they're doing it because they love it and it's, it's where they want to be and what they want to be doing. Uh, and uh, just to maybe kind of expand a little bit and almost kind of circle around to that, that kind of hike your own hike thing, um, they're, they're, there's so many different people out there. It's, it's, it's incredible. I saw people that were 70 years old. I saw a girl that was nine years old. Uh, the physical abilities, you know, mental toughness, the reasons you're being out there, you know, the goals you have, all these things, everybody, it, they're all completely different. And yet, you're all out there doing the same thing, and that's pretty amazing. Um, Andrew mentioned the, uh, the AT, and it was kind of interesting to me because I was here at last year's meeting, and I was talking to one of the panelists, and she said, there's a big difference between hiking the AT and the LT, and I kind of understood what she meant, but not really, and now I really do. 
Uh, and, and the difference is, you know, the people that are out there on the AT, they're, they're doing numbers. You know, they're, they're out there for volume purposes. They're doing 1,700 or whatever miles. They're, they're, they're 10 by 10s. I hike 10 miles before 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they're in their sleeping bags at 5 p.m. They're up at 5 a.m. Uh, though you will be walking the same physical path through the wilderness, you know, and occupying the same space, you are not on the same trail. Uh, you don't have, you know, the same motivations and reasons that they do. And I think for the first little chunk of it, especially starting down in the south, there was almost like a little bit of compulsion, you know. If you're not really sure what you're doing, a lot of times it's your nature to go out and kind of just follow along with the crowd. And if the crowd is AT folks, they're, you know, they're doing something different. And it took a couple of days to break out of that and say, hey, man, you know what? You guys go ahead in your bags at five. You know, we're going to go build a campfire. We're going to be social. We're going to be, you know, a little more mellow. So don't get those two things confused because they are very different, even though they're kind of the same. Does anybody know um, how long the AT is in Vermont for? Yeah. It's, it's like a hundred. There's a hundred. Pretty much a hundred, uh, isn't it? It's about a hundred and forty. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you need the seven voided Killington, right? So the AT Killington. starts at the, you know, where the Long Trail starts at the Mass, at the Mass Vermont border is where the AT comes into Vermont from Massachusetts. And then they share the same treadway until uh, Main Junction at Killington, where the AT then splits off to go east to Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, and the Green Mountain Club maintains the AT for its entirety here. Um, and, you know, same as the Long Trail, it's a long distance footpath, but as Daniel said, like, the, the impetus to do that might be different than taking the three months off of full-time work to go hike the Long Trail and go right back. Um, so I think they both offer different things. Yeah? I was wondering how many of you started in the south versus the north? I started in the south. The benefit is if you don't, if you don't well, I don't obviously you don't know what you're doing. I mean, you know, you, you kind of have to know a little something. But uh, it's it's less physically challenging in the south. The the peaks are not as high. The ground, the slopes, the trails, much more gradual. And uh, for me, aside from I didn't want to end in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> uh, should, I, should I not have said that? <laughs> My bad. Uh, that was part of, you know, part of the reasons that we northbounded was to, uh, to kind of work your way up to it. You know, you don't, you don't want to walk out of your house and slam into JP Peak and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty hardcore. Uh, so that, that gives you a little chance to kind of catch up to it, I think. Well, I would say um, I did northbound. So I started in Massachusetts and went to Canada. Um, but I'm from Pennsylvania. So once I got up there, <laughs> it, it was because I'm not a numbers person. I'm not really a planning person. Um, and everything usually always works out, um, but getting home from up there was more difficult. So I would consider, and I have considered if I go to do it again, starting in the north and coming south for that reason, because once you come south, you have a lot more options for getting places. Yeah, another thing that I, I we did um, south to north, um, there are a lot more people in the south, um, for better or for worse, but I found that comforting while I was kind of getting used to being out there. And then I think the, uh, the AT like curved off and then we had a night in a shelter, me and my dad, and I woke up and I was like, oh, I slept so well. And he was like red eyed. He was like, did you not hear the pack of coyotes? <laughs> <laughs> But like, if you're just getting used to being in the woods, I think that that's another kind of benefit is being with those AT folks and, and just getting the groove. Yeah. Can I, one thing, uh, I think another point to that is uh, the weather and the timing of your hike. Um, so say you wanted to start your LT hike on um, September 15th or end of September even, you'd rather probably start in the north um, and go south because, you know, Jay Peak is almost Canada and it's pretty cold. Um, and I think another point is right now in this kind of transition that season that we're in, a mud season, um, the north will be much holding snow much later. Um, as, as Russ knows, JD is still covered in snow. Um, whereas there are probably places in the south around now um, or within a week or so that you can start hiking. So if you're starting in May, which, you know, if you're starting in June, starting in the south and going north to let that dry out and stuff. Um, and black flies, and um, <coughs> really making it sound appealing. The, the black flies are really something special. Um, and for, for those of you, I, I, I have a little video of it, which I, I dare not screen here publicly, but uh, we got caught in quite a, quite a mess of black flies. And uh, until, you, you know, until you've been there, let me, let me tell you something, boy. <laughs> they, are, they are the truth. Do you have a question, Norma? Um, yeah, I just wanted your opinions on our insight on like 
the part where it overlaps and like how packed the shelters are or like there's no place to pitch a tent it's always down south because of the AT. I mean, yeah, we, it, it, everything's crowded, you know, like, and, and the AT hikers are, you know, there's probably as many of AT, AT as LT hikers. And once you, you cross that threshold, like, in north of Killington, they all make a right, you know, and start heading east. And then, you know, the, the shelter populations. I never had a problem. I mean, we hiked from June 4th to July 4th. I tented twice, on both times by choice. Uh, I never didn't have room. Uh, and you know what? People are really, you know, people are really accommodating out there. You know, when things are tight, you know, people will will, will make it happen. You know, we, we got to Goddard, and I think we had 15 people or something in the shelter. It was, you know. Excuse me one second, Daniel. Jenny, you guys stayed in the shelters, didn't you, for the most part? We actually, because we had the dogs, we stayed in we stayed in a tent. Yeah. Um, but, but I will tell you that when we had a different experience in August, uh, there were many a night we probably wouldn't have fit in the shelters in the southern part of the state. Um, they were pretty pretty packed. Um, the one night that we did stay in the shelter down in the southern part of the state, uh, we got there around the time that most people pull in, but they all came in later, and people had to tent all, all around. So the, while you're on the AT section, um, there's definitely, you can anticipate there may be a night with a, it's a pretty tight squeeze. Um, the other thing is there is a bit of a, seems to be a bit of a hierarchy. The AT hikers pull in early. Um, they expect that they have an expectation that um, LT hikers and day hikers will likely have a tent and will be sleeping not in the shelter. <laughs> all night. You can also, depends on when you start in the year, too. I started later. So there are bubbles. They've pretty much all gone by. When I, when I got back on in mid-September, if they weren't already by most of Vermont, for the most part, they weren't making it up to Maine. So it's definitely a lot quieter that time of year. But also, you can also find bubbles of them. And if you end up getting packed with a whole bunch of them, try to either hang back or go up faster. Because they do, AT hikers tend to travel in what they call them bubbles, where there's a whole bunch of them at once. At least that's what I saw. Um, another thing to be mindful of is that um, when the college students come back, they'll do a lot of uh, like get to know you orientations out there, and you might be minding your own business, and then all of a sudden it's like the locusts, and they're like, and they're not supposed to hike in like groups larger than seven, but there's like 25 undergraduates who are just making friends for the first time. You have to be. What, uh, uh, like, it was bad. Make an announcement regarding that Green Mountain Club works to prevent <laughs> groups of larger than ten on overnight trips on the long trail. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation later and I'll do some digging. Oh, I'm so excited! Great, yeah. right, <laughs> right under the bus. She, she has lots of picture video of it, so yeah. 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 At that point, we try to uh, you know share that shelters are first come, first come, first serve facility. Um, so always having a backup of some sort is smart. Um, because on a night like yes. this. If you're planning on staying in a shelter and you can't, you're going to have a pretty horrible night. Not a bad time. And there's no guarantee that a shelter will be full um, or empty. Yeah, you know, you might want to consider that when you're planning, too. If you don't have a tent, if you absolutely have to find shelter, wherever it is you're going to end up for the night, cut your mileage down, get there earlier. It's like you said, it's first comes, first served. If you show up at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be out there stuck. You know, the, that's, that's part of the way, you know, to approach it. I can't make a big day today, so we're going to do a shorter one and make sure you get a spot. I have a question for you, Jenny. Did you guys share one tent, or did you have multiple tents? Or We did. We shared... Um, one tent, all four of us. Um, we had purchased it a few years ago. It was uh, one of the things that we didn't do is replace all of our gear for this. Um, and so we kept that. It packed in at six pounds, which isn't too bad for a four person, two dog tent. <coughs> which by the way, please don't ever put your tent in a shelter. Hold on one second. Okay. I have a question.
we've had some funky experiences um, out backpacking, not just on the long trail, but out backpacking. And I would say that even with that, um, I, when I take, I often by myself take a group of girls out and um, we will sometimes split into multiple spaces and I feel pretty comfortable on the long trail more than anything else. The majority of, we once had our pack stolen, it wasn't on the long trail, it's where there are a lot more day hikers. On the long trail I felt a lot more safe um, and so I would, I would feel comfortable with two hammocks with myself and one of my daughters. I would stay in shouting distance. Yeah. That, that, that would be my, you hike yeah. with your kids. I, I, just, I hammock hike with my son. And I uh, stay in shouting distance. Yeah, we don't move too far away from each other. Well, you don't hike on the long trail, you can set up two hammocks close to yeah. each other. Yeah. yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I, I, we've never really done it to where you're not usually going off the same tree you know, on one end. Yeah. Hmm. One other thing I'd say is, you know, we're all in this room together here, we're all interested in learning about hiking the long trail. It seems like a pretty good community. And that's yep. largely what you find yeah. out there. There might be a few, um, not even bad eggs, but just a few eggs. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. you know, the, annoying the people were definitely our highlight on the on the yep. trip. Like yeah. we'd we'd had a bad experience, like I said, when I took a group of girls out and our packs were stolen and I, the the girls were a little bit nervous one of the first nights and they they were so excited by the people and how well they were generally treated they either they either didn't say much to us or they treated them so well um, and so I would be totally comfortable. Yes, Like this is kind of alarming, and then they started making food, and they were like, "Do you guys want some of like some of this? Do you want to play cards?" Like they were just such nice, sweet people. So like when you've been hiking the AT maybe for two thousand miles, like you're a little rough, but it's it's just like there's this trail magic and this community out there. Um, I also think like there's something really neat about the fact that you're hiking often from shelter to shelter. Uh, so there's like journals in each shelter. So you might be kind of following behind somebody who's writing notes for, you know, six days or ten days, and then you, you catch up to them and you've been reading about their journal their journey the whole time. Or um, because there's that, that communal space at the end of the night, you're, you're leapfrogging or you're starting to make friends. And, and these people, you know, maybe you start out slow in the morning and then they pass you and then you catch up for lunch. Just, it's just it becomes like this moving caravan kind of community. Yeah, communication is very cool. Like, it's almost like social media, but written down in you know in notebooks. And uh, you know there there is actually like a messaging system the trail has. If somebody is hiking faster than you and you want to talk to somebody ahead of you, you can tell them something and they'll let you know. And I actually managed to send a couple messages like that by asking somebody who was moving a lot quicker than me, like, hey, when you find my niece, tell her to stop and wait for me. So, um, for, and for uh, you guys to know the Log books in the shelters all get brought back to the club yeah. here and get put into our archives. They do, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so we have long trail shelters uh, going back, you know, decades. Um, so it might seem like you're writing in that for yourself, which you are, but it's also really cool because it's creating this never ending history of people on the trail. I mean, size wise, like that is big. 48 is mine. I, I have a 60. Yeah, 60 liter 60 yeah, liter bag. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. She doesn't do numbers. <laughs> mine's, I do, but I don't know. Mine's 50, I mine was 53. Okay. And you can have a 100 liter pack, but yeah. at the end of the day, you got to be able to carry it. And, and you can also go, I, the ways I went, actually mine's 65, sorry. I, was, I have a 50 and a 65. But 
I just find I go bigger and you can cinch it down and make it smaller. So I, I do sometimes where I need more gear, I'd rather have enough room rather than having to not have enough room. So you can always cinch them down or take the top off or whatever. Have, having kid size packs was really important for yeah. kids. Yeah. Oh yeah, the right size packs. The right size packs. Get them, get them fitted, whatever it is, because they make small, medium, large, depending on your size, your frame, your torso and stuff. If you have the wrong size bag, it's not going to hit the right spots. It's going to be miserable. Or it could be. Yeah, you really shouldn't even feel the weight. If, you're, if yep. you have the right size pack and you're mounted, your weight goes right on your hips. Yep. Nothing pulling up here at all. This is just to keep it from flopping around. And when you get that, I'll tell you, it's really cool. When you get it right, you get 40 or something pounds of weight extra on you. You don't really feel it. It's, uh, you know, when, when that's dialed up, it, you can, you know, you, you can go five times further than if it's pulling you yep. back or it's, you know, you know it's, it's all how you set it up. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of that question, like is there something that you all, if you could just say really quickly what you dropped on your first, you know, three days or something. Metal candle lantern. <laughs> that seems like an obvious one. It was just, it was little. It was special. <laughs> no special. Uh, small, yeah, right, only functional, right? I brought a small solar panel thinking I'd, because I, all my stuff is rechargeable, so I'm like, hey, I'll, uh, you know, recharge my uh, steri pen, my headlamp, everything else. There's not enough sun and you're moving too much and you're in the woods. So. I had a glass bottle of Cholula, so I had to transfer it to plastic and that made it much more um, carryable. So just like the containers that I was carrying things in wasn't the right, right ones. I don't know. I feel like I used pretty much everything that was in my bag. There was lots of stuff I got rid of along the way. I started with a lot of like just in case. Like, just in case I have extra zip ties, and just in case I have extra this, and I have, I didn't need all those just in cases. So I would get rid of those as I went. But really, like, everything that was in there, I, I did use. And by the end, I was able to be down to just that <coughs> stuff, which I think was good. And even when I packed up my pack this week, I was like, yeah, this was everything. I used everything in here, except for a few, like, first aid items, which I'm happy I didn't use. And even that was very minimal. But yeah, I pretty much used everything that was in there. Um, I would definitely not pack too many clothes. <laughs> um, I definitely overpacked on clothes at the beginning, so I enjoyed a number of clothes. There were a couple of things that I switched in and out. Um, we had the um, small Sawyer micro filter. <laughs> Does not filter fast enough, no. so we swapped that out for our bigger filter. Uh, our bigger filter that we had before had brought flip flops um, because it's really nice to get out of your shoes at night. Um, ended up swapping those over for Crocs because you can't wear socks and flip flops, and in August it is cold on the top of Killington. So definitely um, swap those uh, those things out. Didn't use our, our um, first aid kit, but would definitely right. mm -hmm. would definitely still bring it because um, we have needed it on other hikes and and even need it, you need it. to wear the socks with Crocs. I found because I was kind of I'm not wearing Crocs. <laughs> I went through a whole like camp shoe of I wasn't using camp shoe that I would just take my inserts out of my shoes at the beginning, and then I got flip flops, and then I got Crocs. Um, but the other nice thing about wearing socks was that, like, I found at night the bugs would eat. Like, when I was sitting around, like, the mosquitoes would get my feet, which is, like, the one place you don't want mosquitoes getting. So having socks on in the Crocs was, for me, really helpful because I wanted to protect my feet. Yeah. The other, the nice other thing, thing that about we... camp shoes is, uh, you know, our, our campsites are, are impacted and they're used a lot. And a camp shoe has much less of a ground surface impact than like a big, heavy, blood sole boot. And so your actual impact on the surface of a campsite is less if you're wearing leather footwear. Um, and that's just like a really basic with no trace principle is carrying a pair of camp shoes to switch into at a shelter. There's two other things that I would say too. Um, food, we overpacked on food when we when we were out down in the southern part. It took us a lot less time than we thought and we decided that we needed to be really diligent about what we brought. Um, what we brought for food along the way, because that's what that was the heaviest thing in our pack. Um, and so, uh, after our first resupply, we're like, okay, we can. We, there's no more what ifs. What if right. we get stuck? <laughs> no it's, more just in case. No more just just in case. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've done a lot of expedition travel, and the, my big recommend is actually not train to limits. That is don't.
and you guys can probably speak to this as well, but there's a balance between a camp shoe and a trail runner and a big hiking boot. And that's a big that's a preference for what oh, you yeah. want. Maybe uh, maybe for Andrew, you know, the biggest of the crowd, having boots that can absorb some of that impact. Yeah. Or little tiny trail runners. I wear, I wear trail runners. Yeah. Merrill trail runners. And I find I'm agile enough that if I start to roll my ankle, I just hop real quick. And that's where trekking poles help you with that, too. Thank you. Thank you, I've been negotiating with my son about trail runners versus me trying to get him into a big, big it's, boot, so I've got just the big it's, I think it's, it's, it really is preference. I used to hike with big, heavy hiking boots, and I just got sick of the weight on them, and I realized I didn't really need it. I think I'm agile enough that if I, like I said, I did almost roll my ankle several times, at least half a dozen, if not more. And I just always find myself pop up and hop real quick, and the trekking poles were huge to help that. So oh, maybe else? I got lucky, I don't know. Yeah, I got lucky. Done that. Yeah, I used big, um, like, high boots because that's all I'd ever had. So I didn't really want to start, like, trying something new while I was on a trail. It's like, this is what I'm comfortable with. Why change it? Yep. Um, so I just stuck with those. I got a new pair, but not a new pair of something else. Yeah, I think it's a lot of preference. I have Saucony trail runners that I wouldn't change that for the world. Like, I tried boots, and that does not work for me. But the only addition I would add to the trail runners is I use gaiters. Um, so Dirty Girl gaiters are awesome, and they hook right on, lightweight. Like, that's, that's to me, number one. So that's my combo, and I will use that for as long as I can. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I personally, I wouldn't think about doing it without, uh, you know, a serious pair of boots um, for a couple of reasons. One is that I don't really have to uh, worry about where I'm stepping. And uh, there's some gnarly, gnarly rock and stuff out there. I mean, sharp things. Um, your footing is, uh, especially in really bad weather, a lot of times your focus is, is limited to, you know, literally three or four feet in front of you because you've got to actually look carefully at the next step you're about to take. Uh, I don't know how I could have done it in the lousy weather without, you know, boots that I didn't have to worry about where I was going to come down on. I mean, they're, you know, Waterproof to a point. I mean, if you're standing out in a rainstorm, you know, eventually you'll soak through. It doesn't matter. Uh, but between the support that I got, you know, I never worried about rolling, you know, anything. It was just, you know, foot down and take the next step. So without that, you know, I I would have been in trouble. I packed four. So I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna repeat. So she's asking about food and how many days before she can carry. What was your favorite thing and what would you never want to see again? So, uh, well, um, when we when we started, we were we I think we were planning for a camping trip, not a hiking trip. Maybe me and my dad. And so we we went through the first four days, and then my mom showed up with um, Ziploc bags for a resupply of frozen lasagna. And they went into dad's bag, and I just, like, have never seen him look more despondent in my life. <laughs> just like, boom, boom. Um, so as I went, by the end of it, I was just eating dried meals. And some of those, like, those dried backpacker meals, I don't know if it was just because I was so hungry, but I was like, I would eat this at home. Yeah, yeah, this is the best yeah. thing I've ever eaten. Yeah, things, things taste surprisingly good when you're out there. Yeah, dried food, I mean, Starbucks via dried mix, um, like a Lara bar. And then I treated myself with a Snickers bar every single day, which I'll recommend. Yes. I was, I was going to say that. Bring, bring a little bit of snacks, like Snickers at the end or um, whatever it is your favorite thing, something good to get. I did the same thing. I had dehydrated food that I dehydrated myself prior to going. It's really, really light. You just got to boil some water and throw it in there, and you can, you can dehydrate pretty much anything. So whatever your favorite meal is, I had spaghetti and meat sauce or um, ramen noodles with a bunch of vegetables thrown in. You can dehydrate it and rehydrate it again. And it's tastes, and once you get hyped your stomach, it really doesn't matter if it is actually as good as at home. It still tastes just <laughs> yeah. good. You know, just, just to counter that a little bit as well, I was, I was actually surprised and we all had, I don't know how many meals out of foil packets and dried things, dehydrated things. I was kind of amazed that people, people that were out there that really, really knew what they were doing, they were eating fresh food. Yeah. Like they had cheeses and they were making salads and like cooking things and that was like, hey, wow, like these people really, you know, are on a different level because they're, you know, first of all, I don't know where they're getting it from. They're getting fresh produce and stuff like that unless they just went into town. But uh, I was really amazed that, uh, you know, for example, you go out and buy yourself, uh, you know, a, a block of, uh, you know, cheddar cheese or something like that. You throw that in your food bag. That's good for a week. 
you don't have to refrigerate it, you know what I mean? Like stuff that you might normally keep around in a fridge is perfectly fine to bring out there, uh, hard sausages and stuff like that. You know, once I started to see what people were doing and, and kind of learn more about it, I definitely changed what was going in my food bag. And there were things that I didn't think of that, you know. And, and Alexis, did you have a you know, yeah, I um, I carried cheese the whole time, but I did a lot of research beforehand about how to package cheese because, like, if you put it in certain things, it'll get moldy. So I was like always making sure to wrap it in like wax paper and put it in like saran wrap instead of a plastic bag because it needs to breathe. Um, and then I made all my own meals, but instead of dehyd like making something and then dehydrating it, I went online and bought like. I don't know, it was like 20 different little baggies of um, dehydrated vegetables and then just kind of mixed my own. Um, and that worked out pretty well. Um, but I didn't try them beforehand, so it was kind of like some of them would be great. And then I'd try one one night and it was like, oh no, I made five more of these. <laughs> so it was pretty hit and miss, but I mean, you're saying it's like you're so hungry out there that anything is good at the end of the day. At the end of the table, I really liked the little packages of like seasoned tuna fish, mm -hmm. those were really good. Um, and I never want to eat again gorp, there were just things that you, <laughs> my parents made me eat gorp, like here's a snack, but it just gets old, it's like. <laughs> Can you explain for everybody what gorp is? It's like <laughs> raisins and nuts and m and Jenny, did you guys cook all your meals? in unison as, as a family, so like breakfast would be the same, lunch would be the same, dinner would be the same. Yeah, yeah. so, it, and that the one consideration with that is that for us, because of that, like a little jet boil stove wouldn't work, our whisper light that we've had for 20 years worked great because you could boil a lot more water than you could in the jet boil. And yes, we did it all as a, as a group. Every day someone will have a meltdown. <laughs> as far as food, could I say something real quick? Um, I will let you know that you can through hike stoveless. So if you have any questions about that, um, I can talk to you about that afterwards or whatever. But I didn't have a stove um, and didn't through hike with one. So you can do that. Um, we can get some questions in through our very technologically advanced live chat. Whoa. So I'm going to uh, post some of that and just direct them at one of you guys and if you can answer that so that people watching at home can also uh, get some information about it. Uh, Hillary, may I ask you how much water you should go through a day in July or how much you should have? Like as a person in general, as a human being? Um, I, you know, as I as I went through the trail, and, and I did it over a period of years, so I just got more experience. I was eating way more and drinking more at the end than I was at the beginning. I just realized, like, I need to be stopping every 30 minutes and giving my body something, and it kept my my mind and that, that like, negative self-talk about how hard it was to a minimum. It was like a calorie thing. So I think water-wise, hot day in July, gosh, I'd go through like five, sometimes like four liters or five liters of water. And, and um, I would be even, I carry, uh, I have room in my pack for up to four. I like to carry three. And if I know that there's water, I'll be um, pumping as I go. So walking from stream to stream. And, and really, I, I like to always be in a position where I've got enough and I don't have to be rationing it. I always want to have enough so I can just drink what I need. Cool. Another question was, um for Alexis, I was thinking of starting late August or beginning of September. What is the best time to hike the trail to avoid the flies and mosquitoes? Um, well, I was out there late July into early August, um, so I might have a little bit of insight on the August bit. That the mosquitoes weren't too bad. There was only maybe like two nights or so where I had to put on bug spray, and other than that, I didn't use it the entire time. Um, and I never had 
a major problem with the flies. Like there were a couple times where they'll like take a chunk of skin and then you'll just see this like bleeding spot on your ankle and it's like, where did that, like did it eat it? Where did it, is it building a nest somewhere? And I don't know what they do with it still, but um, so you still are gonna run into some bugs out there. But um, yeah, August was all right. And I'm sure September is probably better. So. Yeah. September there weren't a lot. Another question we got is um, a little specific, but maybe if somebody feels like they've got an answer for that. How feasible do you think it is for a trail runner to hike 20 to 30 miles a day in the first 100 miles with a 40 pound pack? Sounds like a math problem. With a 40? <laughs> did you say with a 40 pound pack? If that does not sound not feasible. If that does not sound realistic, what does sound realistic? Maybe I can post an answer to this. Um, 20 to 30 miles with a 40 pound pack for the first 100 miles probably is a tough way to break it in, like we were talking about getting yeah. your legs under you. Um, maybe maybe that person might want to uh, dial it down a little bit at the beginning, would you agree? Um, yeah. I think Jenny said at the beginning, like, like long trail miles are different than miles somewhere else. So like if anyone has hiked a lot out west, um, when you come to Vermont, like this was the first trail, long distance trail they ever cut. They didn't switch it back. Like it's like straight up, and it's um it's rocky and rooty and it's technical, which I think is awesome. But you just can't get that same kind of mileage. You can't hoof it in the same way. That that was actually our joke on the trail. Like the long trail was must have been built by twenty somethings who didn't know the term switchback. <laughs> they just didn't. Listen, <laughs> yes, uh, we just had uh, the record for men's time. It's like forty eight minutes. It's like under forty eight. Yeah, yeah. Like so that's like. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever's out there, there's a documentary on Netflix called Gaining Traction. It's about a woman Gaining Traction. It is yeah. in five days, uh, fully supported. So yep. check that out. See if that's experience for you. Or if you just want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that is a really cool movie. Yeah. We have a copy of that here at the club, and um, yeah, that picture of Andrew's feet. That looks yeah. like nothing compared to what wow. she went through in that movie. Yeah, so fantastic. That, is that, really that said, the AT hikers are doing 20 miles a day yeah. um, up they're, here. They're yeah. and I, I think that's where get, you know, they come in and mm -hmm. they've done that 1,700 miles already and they're able to move in the you do get them come back. I don't know if you, anybody ran into a lot of uh, AT hikers. They come and they do that lower 140. Well, then they'll backtrack and they want to finish the LT also. So they'll come do the northern part. And they get on there, and I remember hearing a lot of them that I ran into say that wow. that northern part is the hardest part, yep, yeah. harder than any part of the whole AT, was that, the northern part of Vermont. That says a lot, considering how long the AT is. When yeah. those guys get up here and they say, wow, we thought we were hiking and climbing, and you know, yep. we weren't until we got here. So mileage that you can get on elsewhere, you're, you're probably not going to get in Vermont. It's not safe. Um, so I think we're going to probably do some questions for another 10 minutes or so, and then uh, around 8.30 I want to break out, and if anybody has specific questions for anybody up here, Questions about how heavy your pack is. I think you all have loaded your packs the way that they would be generally. More or less. And so, like, you can test that out a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to address that, that question about the 40 pound pack because there's a, there's a saying that the difference between 20 and 30 pounds is 10 pounds, and the difference between 30 and 40 pounds is 100 pounds. I, I would believe that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably about right. I would, I would definitely believe that. As soon as you start hitting anything above 30, you can definitely feel it. <laughs> Empty to going heavy with your fully restocked is a huge difference. That's the big thing. When you're restocked, you know, I mean, like you, you get afraid of that number, whatever that big number is, yeah. and it can be a scary number. But that's not your number like all the time. That's your number like day one, and then you know you get to you get to take a little bit off that every day. So it's Anything ebbs and flows. Else? Yes, sir. Any other comments on good dog etiquette, uh, both how you're dog you your dog goes when I can talk a bit too, too, you want. You did the whole way. Yeah, do you want to go? Um, you definitely want to have your dog on the leash um, near the shelter, because um, not everybody is dog friendly. So if you have your dog, we went, we ran into uh, this one family that um, was really scared of dogs, and I, we were just hiking, and they got freaked out with our two little dogs. So you definitely want to be aware of them. So bring a leash, and, and that actually was in where we ran into that family. It was kind of a bad experience all around. It wasn't actually in a shelter area even. So when you're getting to the busier areas, um, 
where there are a lot of day hikers, we also would leash the dogs. Um, we made sure that we brought something warm for them. Um, it was valuable to have them hike in a harness because there are several places where there are ladders um, and even a big dog, we, we used to have a lab, even a big dog couldn't get around, get around those. So having them in a harness made it a lot easier to take them up and down. We always carried a tent um, because we, in general, unless the shelter was empty, we stayed in a tent because not all, it's not fair to the other, other folks. Can I answer an as well? Um, the, so other things about dogs is dog waste is the same as human waste. So if you wouldn't poop on the side of the trail yourself, then you shouldn't let your dog do that. Um, and the appropriate thing for that is leaving on trails, taking a cat home. That was a big splash of That was. Um, <laughs> Make a big boom soon. And then other notes are, yeah, exactly, carrying a leash yes. and leashing your dog in public places and also leashing your dog above tree line. Um, because same as a human, if they trample off the trail, some of those fragile outcome plants will be affected. Can you want to jump in for just a second? I have something to say about taking the dog. That's the best reason I've ever heard to leash a dog. <laughs> I think it's case by case with your dog too, how well yeah. it's trained, how well, I mean. Yeah. And there's a difference between somebody's perceived voice control and actual voice control. Yep. yep. Um, and so we really, you know, you want that voice control to be 100% voice control when being called. I've, we were talking earlier, I've seen a dog with a mouthful of porcupine quills, and that is not something you want to experience on a long trail. I'm sure that some of you guys might have seen the shelters that are not by porcupines, they're out there. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, ma'am. Didn't see many bear cans. Uh, bear cans are really from, like the you know a couple of people had them from down south and stuff oh, like small that. Small stuff, yeah. But yeah, I didn't I didn't see cans at all. Mostly bags, you know. I mean, if you hang your stuff, like the the, the big thing you're worried about is not bears, but really like rodents and mice and stuff that'll eat they'll eat right through your pack, through your food bag, you know, and out the other side of it. So mostly, if you keep your stuff, you know, reasonably compartmentalized and just hung up, you know, you don't you probably don't need a bear can. It's that's overkill. Okay. Always outside oh, the outside, tent. Outside, yeah, always um, outside. And at the places where there are, if there ever is a bear we'll concern, they'll tree, have um, a bear box. Yep. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, you want to hang your food and keep it out of your tent. We've had bear encounters, not yep. in the, on the long trail, but yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd, I'd add to that, um, the bear population of Vermont is growing, and black bears yes. are becoming more and more aggressive, and they will, because the hiker population is growing as well. There's just a natural, you know, those four hikers that might not store their food well or might leave their food bag outside their tent on the ground during mid-May, that bear becomes habituated. And the saying is a fed bear is a dead bear. Um, any bear that gets food becomes more and more habituated and therefore becomes more and more dangerous. Um, so Green Mountain Club is, we would very much promote bear canisters along the long trail. Um, there were three bear issues last year um, that prompted action by the club. Um, we put in bear boxes at Story Spring, Kid Gore, Seth Warner has it. Um, and the safest thing is a bear canister that, in my experience, you can fit roughly three to five days of food in there. And people will complain because they're, they're heavy a little bit. They might be kind of tough to fit into a pack. But the other side is that you don't lose your food and you're not feeding a bear. And um, you might say, well, we can do a bear hang, but there are many places on the long trail um, that are shelters that might not have that perfect branch to swing a, swing a line. That's what I ask because we, we do a lot of um, long distance hiking um, and we always have a bear can and I, I'm, I bring the kitchen, he brings the food uh, <coughs> and uh, I'm always surprised how many people bring the bear can. Yeah, I, did, I, did I never have. Yeah, I haven't seen it. didn't see any. They are heavy and, uh, and bulky. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that if we want to get ahead of the curve here, um, making sure that everybody's bear aware um, and 
you know, it's, it's also, if you're a first time hiker and you're going out to hike the long trail and you've never made a bear hang before, the safer thing is buy yourself a, a $60 bear canister and never have to worry about you being the culprit or you being the problem. Um, there, uh, I was going to say, you know, there are actually other, other options to the big plastic cans now I've seen, like Kevlar pouches and things that are kind of like advanced materials and they're really strong. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, weren't you guys on the yeah. yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll ruin your, your lunch for sure. Uh, I've but. seen a bear unzip a fanny pack. I've seen, and I just outed that you have a fanny pack, Dad. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't actually, but now you did. Um, I actually had a question. When you are hiking with a bear canister, where do you, do you keep that outside the tent? Or yes, you yeah, your food is out. It's still leaving no trace. Um, and there are ones that are, you know, in the Adirondacks now, there are certain places where they are required. And if you're found without a bear canister, you will be fine. Um, and there are ones, even even some canisters are stronger than others. Um, and so, you, you know, I think that if you're if you're in an area where you're confident that you'll have the tree to do a perfect bear hang, then that's great. Um, but in other areas, um, there might be there might be some. Yeah, and the difference. Yeah. So, a quick note. Whites have bear boxes at most of their sites um, because in the White Mountains there's maybe 16 overnight sites total. The Long Trail is 70 overnight sites. Every one of those bear boxes is a couple hundred dollars and they're not light. Um, so outfitting those along the Long Trail, some people might say, well, why do you have a bear box everywhere? But it's not feasible within our program right now. Um, so the public being bear aware is really the best thing that we can do here. Um, where else? Jeez, tornadoes. Flash flood warning. Yeah. Yeah, floods, tornadoes, whatever. Um, so I think we're going to have time for maybe one more question, and then we'll, um, we'll break out, and if anybody's got questions or, or other issues that we'd like to tackle, then, then do that. But yes, sir. For those of you who pitch tents, did you pitch tents next to the uh, shelter, or did you pitch it on trail, or did you go off trail? I mean, you're not supposed to pitch it on the trail. That's a no-no, um, but I mean, I only I only tented twice, and both times by choice. One time was because I thought the shelter was kind of smelly, and the other time was because this girl really annoyed me. Um, but <laughs> the, there's always room, you know what I mean? Like, and, and it helps to kind of be within the cluster, you know. Uh, if you're feeling antisocial, then you know, go go away from the shelter. But almost everybody that tented that I saw tenting, you know, kind of just expanded the area that was already there instead of going, you know, too far away. Another one down there, anybody? Um, I tented, I tented the majority of the time. There were only a few times I stayed in the shelter. And really the important thing is knowing the leave no trace principles. Um, you know, you're not going to tent ever on the trail. I mean, you hear about that in the case of an emergency, that that's the only option, but that's not really what you're going to do. So I would familiarize yourself with the leave no trace principles, you know, that you should be X amount a feet lorn from the trail. 200. 200, okay, there Lots we go. Lots of water. Um, yeah, from water. Um, the, all of those things are really important. And like dispersed camping is really important. There are tent pads at places as well. Yeah. Um, but tenting's great. I, I loved all of my experiences tenting along the trail. Yeah. Might I just add to that? Because we, we tented almost the entire time. Yeah. And there were times where we were hiking I tried to plan that actually, and I said, hey, I'm going from A to B today, but if I don't make it to B, what am I going to do? Well, this looks like a good place to tent, but then when you actually get there, it's, you know, like a 40 degree pitch of, you know, boulders sticking out or something, and it, it's just not possible. I mean, the answer is you keep walking. And the leave no trace message on camping is you never want to impact a site that hasn't been impacted already. Yeah. Um, and so there's, so if you're at a shelter, you want to be in a site that looks like it has been designated as the place that already has tenting happening at it. So, you know, 
big open forest where you see all these shoots coming up and beautiful leaves, don't put your tent down on that. Put your tent down on the area that's already being impacted that you're not going to cause further damage to. And there's plenty of those areas around the shelters. We were always yeah. able to find a spot around the, sh around the shelter. But one of the things that was really helpful is the Long Trail book yep. will tell you whether there's tenting around the shelter or not. There are a couple, a very small few exceptions where it really clearly says there is no tent pad. I can't remember if it was Butler or Taylor, but yep. one of the two yeah. of them Butler has Lodge, no space. Uh, Taft Lodge, a couple others are at a high up on elevation, yeah, surrounded right. by a pretty fragile criminal forest, and so we request them to stay inside of this. Yep. Does it have the impact of uh, tenting versus hammock? Yeah, so that's a good question. That's one that comes up a lot. Um, you know, I'm going to tackle this unless, and then if you guys have opinions. Um, hammocks, you obviously above the surface. Um, so that's great. But, you know, with looking for a place to sleep going up the south side of Killington, um, you're not really going to find a place to string a hammock. So, because the trees are small um, and it's very, very well packed, and so it might be tough to find a spot in there. So, I think that the leave no trace impact is um, dependent on the site that you're at, but more important is considering whether you're able to get yourself um, accustomed to the peculiarities of hammock versus tenting. Um, because it's not possible at both sites all, all the time. And also, what, what kind of trees you do. I, I hammock tent a lot, and I know I don't do it on like um, pines or anything, because it'll rip the bark off, mm -hmm. depending on what you're using. If you're using a tree saver, hopefully, um, or you know, 550 cord will start to tear that off. So, you know, try to find oaks, stuff where the, um, it's not the porous <laughs> bark, and you're not going to hurt the tree as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I like cool. trees. So, you know, I, I think that we've had a lot of great topics. Um, and that there's still a lot of questions to answer because it's you launch it, it's you know three months with a backpack on your back and going full wet. Um, but I think it'd be useful now if we wanted to you know call this kind of session quits and let people come up and, and ask some questions. Uh, I can get some watch out guys at back and show you guys a guidebook, a map, all the individual maps, the end to enders guide, the resources that the Green Mountain Club has available to help with hiking. Another good point is that we maintain a list of all of you, when you completed the launch trail, you check whether you were a mentor. Um, is that correct? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. so we maintain a list of end-to-end -end hikers who are willing to be mentors for future end-to-enders. Um, and so if you're interested in that, then you can send an email to gmc at greenmountainclub.org and we tell us a little bit about what you'd like to learn and we can find a person that you can connect with to learn some of the things that you might want to go hiking. Um, Lastly, I really wanted to thank all of you guys for being willing to come in here and share all your knowledge and expertise. I think it's really wonderful. Um, all the bandanas right there, um, underneath your name tags, you can keep those bandanas. Oh, thank um, you. Just <laughs> right? Um, she was hoping that the whole time. 270 miles for a patch. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just um, so, thank you, everybody. And, um,